Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, I'm the small little head over here, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Krista Burns. I am Krista Burns here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. We're a webinar, we're a webcast, we're an online show. There's a lot of controversy about what to call these things, but whatever we are, we are here live online every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Um, the show is free and open to anyone to watch. Um, we do record every week also, so if you're unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, that's fine. You can always go to our website and view the recordings of all of our shows going back to the very beginning in January 2009 is when we first started Encompass Live. All of our recordings are up on YouTube, so very easy to watch, along with if there are any PowerPoint presentations, any handouts, uh, links to websites related to our shows. We have a whole bunch of show information that is included there as well. Uh, we do a mixture of things here, uh, interviews, mini training sessions, um, book reviews, web tours, whatever, basically anything library related, we will have it on the show. We're, um, I don't know if it's a good or bad thing to say, we're not very picky. If it's about libraries, <laughs> we'll put you on. Yeah, we will have it. Um, we have uh, Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations and things specific to Library Commission, but we also bring in guest speakers. And today we have, I guess, a mixture of that. Well, we mostly, we have the system directors yes. who are going to do the work. Right, yes. Um, this week we've been doing a series, just started last year, mm -hmm. kind of. An of, occasional series. Occasional series mm -hmm. of people coming in and um, library commission staff um, talking about books, um, based doing book, book talks, the kind of things you do in your library. Um, we've had library commission staff come in a couple of times with some themes, and this time, um, Laura Johnson, who's in the middle over here, <laughs> um, she's our CE coordinator, had the idea to have our um, regional library system directors regional library system, yes, come in and talk about what they've been reading or nice books that they like. So um, do we, how are we going to do introductions as we okay. go or how are you guys going to plan? I'm going to introduce everybody the first time and then okay. we're just going to go All sort right. of in. I'm going to hand over to you guys then to okay. take it away. Hi, this is Laura, and um, welcome. We're really excited today to have our system directors here talking about the books they've been reading um, and would like to uh, discuss with you because they're librarians and they like to talk about books. <laughs> um, we're um, going to go kind of in a uh, rotation, and uh, everybody's going to give, I think, three book talks. There are five of them, three book talks that worked out to 45 minutes a good the timing is perfect, um, and it doesn't have to be, actually. Um, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, we hope that maybe this gives you some ideas about reading. And if you have some um, comments on the books as we go along or some questions about the books, uh, we'd love to see them. And uh, we do. there is a bibliography of the book titles, so you don't have to, uh, you know, scribble things down, you can get the list of all the book titles um, that will be online ready for you to download. It's already posted onto the session page for this, for, so yeah. go to the main page for the show today. Um, it's posted on there if you want to go grab it now or you can get it later. It has links to all the books in WorldCat, I believe is what you Yeah. So we are going to start today with Sharon Osenga. Sharon has a little bit of a cold, but she's bravely <laughs> soldiering on and is going to uh, start us off. Then we will go to Eric Green, Denise Harders, Anika Ramirez, and Scott Childers, and then we will, we will rotate again. So Sharon, want to take it away? Yeah, just like. Okay. Our first slide. Oh, Next slide. Got my first title. There we go. Okay, I have chosen. I had a really great reading year last year, and so I chose uh, three really different books to talk about. The first one I'm talking about was a first novel, A Fall of Marigolds by Susan Meisner. Um, this is actually the story of two different women, uh, almost 100 years apart. The first story is about nurse Clara Wood, who witnesses um, some really tragic deaths from the Triangle Shirt Factory fire. Um, and the second story is about Taryn Michaels, who uh, loses her husband in the 2001, uh, September 9-11 World Trade Tower tragedy. 
And as a result of these two tragedies, both of these women travel to what we would call an in-between place. They're not able to go back to the way things were before the tragedy, but they also aren't able to move forward with their lives because they can't deal with what they experienced. Um, for Clara, when we catch up with her story, um, she is a nurse and she is now working on Ellis Island with the immigrants that are coming to the United States. And it all sounds well and good until we find out that since the Triangle Shirt Factory, she has come to Ellis Island and has not left Ellis Island. Mm -hmm. She is basically living in the shell of that island experience of being a nurse. But what happens is when she's working with, she becomes close to some particular immigrants and the century old scarf, the fall of marigolds of the title uh, sparks her interest for the first time since the fire. And she's finally able as she develops this relationship with these immigrants to um, begin to come back to life again and to live uh, a, a real life um, and eventually hopefully leave Ellis Island. The second story is almost 100 years later. Taryn, on the morning of 9-11, is late for breakfast with her husband. She's supposed to meet him for breakfast in the tower. And it's as she's going there, she hears the first plane and sees it hit. And the instant falling of concrete and brick and smoke, she can't see where she's going and she's trying to escape. So she's running and uh, a stranger grabs her and they're trying to, to keep together, but it's so hard. She has inherited the fall of Marigold scarf. She's wearing it that morning. He twines their wrists together so they don't get separated and saves her life. Um, years later, she again has just been living, um, kind of just working and and not really living a full life. She sees a photo in a magazine that brings her back to that day and the savior of her life that day. And um, it kind of opens her life that her eyes to the fact that there is life after tragedy. And um, she's finally able to meet this person and thank him for saving her life that day. Um, this is a book, this is really women's fiction. Um, it was beautifully written for a first novel, and I started it, and I couldn't put it down. I think um, most of us would really empathize with what these women are going through emotionally and how difficult it is to move on after tragedy in our lives. Um, the good thing about this is it does include a reader's guide for use with book club groups. I think this would be a terrific book club um, book to use. Um, so it's probably almost my number one book that I read last year. So I highly recommend this one. Great. Eric. All right. Um, my, like uh, Sharon, my three books are all quite different. Uh, my first one is uh, West with the night by uh, Beryl Markham. I think many people might be familiar with this, but I rediscovered it uh, recently and decided it was something I'd like to talk about. Um, she was, uh, she lived in 1902 to uh, 1986. She was a British born uh, Kenyan aviator, one of the first bush pilots, uh, I think it was the first woman bush pilot in Africa, adventurer, uh, horse trainer, and author. And during the pioneer days of aviation, she was the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic from east to west in 1936, which most people didn't know that. And um, I think that's a, that's a really a fascinating uh, story. Um, she was um, born in the village of uh, uh, Ashwell, England, the daughter of Charles Baldwin. <laughs> Baldwin Clutterbuck, that's hard to say 10 times fast, <laughs> and he was an accomplished uh, horse trainer as well, and when she was four years old, her father moved the family to Kenya, and uh, which was then the, the, the colonial British East Africa area, and they purchased a farm there. Um, although her mother disliked and isolated, uh, was isolated, um, she promptly returned to England, but Beryl stayed um, in Kenya with her father, and, and spent, you know, a lot of time adventure, uh, adventurous childhood, learning, playing, and hunting, and and, and with the with the natives. Um, on her family's farm, she developed a knowledge and a love for horses. She, as a young adult, she became the first licensed female horse trainer in Kenya. Um, she was, um, oh yeah, oh yeah. West of the Night chronicles her experiences during, uh, you know, growing up in Kenya, 
East, East Africa um, in the 1900s, um, and which you know eventually led to her career as a bush pilot. And I believe it was about a five-year period. She was friends with uh, Ernest Hemingway, and he, he wrote about her book and her writings. Um, she was so well-written, so marvelously well, that I was completely ashamed of myself as a writer. <laughs> she can write rings around the rest of us who consider ourselves writers. It's a really uh, bloody wonderful book. And that coming from Hemingway is quite a, <laughs> quite a quote because he was quite, <laughs> I had quite an ego, but I think that's, that's wonderful. Um, uh, Markham's West of the Night was originally published in the, uh, in the early 40s, um, but disappeared for a while and was rediscovered and reprinted in the 1980s and became a smash hit. I think that a lot of uh, literature uh, classes and colleges um, rediscovered this and the quotes, and, and it was uh, so it's something I really want to uh, promote. Although uh, she is best known for being uh, for the aviation record, a solo flight across the Atlantic, the West, she also, was also a bush pilot for the five years in Africa. And she also shared these adventures with uh, Bor Blixen and Dennis, Hayton of Out of Africa fame. You might remember she did have a character in that movie Out of Africa, and I forgot the name they had in her character, Jackie or something. She had a minor role, at least her character, in that, so she was well known and knew those people. Um, I want to end with this, um, with a quote um, that I think is one of the best um, quotes from the book um, about when she had to leave um, Africa. I have learned that if you must leave a place that you have lived and loved, and where all your yesteryears are buried deep. Leave it in any way except a slow way. Leave it the fastest way you can. Never turn back and never believe that an hour you remember is better hour because it is dead. Past years seem safe ones, vanquished ones, while the future lies in a cloud formidable from a distance. So. <laughs> Isn't there a new book coming out about her? You didn't you mention you, you mentioned that to me. There might have been a new one, more a new one. I'm sorry, uh, you know, my my, my mind is a but <laughs> I think you mentioned her. <laughs> there is some so, more new another. Book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, our next person is Denise Harders. <laughs> well, I have selected three audio books to tell you about today, and I listened to The Good Girl while traveling around the Central Plains Library System. With the miles that I drive, I have plenty of time for a long story. This one's on nine CDs and plays for ten and a half hours. The book has nearly 400 pages. But I especially like suspenseful audiobooks because they keep me awake on the road. And this book fit that category very well. There were times I was at my destination and I really hated to get out of the car. <laughs> so I'm sitting there listening wait, and people are wondering why I'm in the car. But I really wanted to hear what happened next. In this story, Mia Dennett is a young inner city art teacher. After being stood up once more by her on again, off again boyfriend, she thinks she's found a safe one night stand. But as it turns out, trusting Colin Thatcher is the worst mistake of Mia's life. Colin was paid to abduct Mia to, and deliver her to his employer. And at the last minute, Colin decides to hide Mia from his deadly superiors and the police. The story of Mia Dennett's kidnapping is told in multiple perspectives by three characters. Mia's British-born mother, Eve Dennett, the tough and gritty Chicago detective assigned to the case, Gabe Hoffman, and the kidnapper, Colin Thatcher. I enjoyed the audiobook because the readers really brought the people to life with their accents and tones of voice. Most of the chapters started with the name of the narrator and then either the word before or after. And the reader, or in my case, the listener, is left to wonder before and after what? And I thought I had it all figured out, but after many twists and turns, I found out that every yes was wrong. It all becomes clear in the final chapter. And this debut novel by Mary Kubica is a psychological thriller that will keep you guessing until the very end. Okay, and our next person, Anika. Okay, so the three books that I chose, they span, they're very broad as well, but they all have um, leading women as their main um, characters. Um, so this first one, The Secret Lives of the Four Wives. Um, the decision to become the fourth wife to Baba Segi was not an easy one for Bolanli. 
She was a university graduate, unaccustomed to the world of polygamy, but life seemed safer away from her demanding mother, alcoholic father, and with a man willing to care for her without questioning her past. But Bolanli could not anticipate the jealousy and manipulation that her unwelcome presence would bring from the three wives and the long-held secrets that would surface. Shonian uh, weaves a coming-of-age story like no other. It's set in Ibadan, Nigeria, and filled with tragedy, perseverance, and acceptance. With each chapter, readers move through the lives of the characters, leaving all, even the cruelest, as sympathetic. The point of view changes occur with each chapter, making it really easy for readers to follow those shifts. Um, there is some sexual content, uh, but this novel was originally published as The Secret Lives of Baba Segi's Wives as well. So it is an international novel and uh, sort of women's fiction. What's the setting? Um, it's in Ibadan, so it's this uh, town in Nigeria, okay. and they move within there. Hmm. Is, and it's contemporary? Um, fairly, yeah. It was written in, uh, or published in 2011, so it's set within that. I admit it's not historic. No. Oh, cool. Okay. I think we're back to Sharon again. No. Scott. Oh, Scott. Oh, sorry, sorry, Scott. Scott. <laughs> That's okay, because I'm talking about a person who got left behind. Uh, yeah. So, okay. my segue uh, there. Um, my first book, and all three of my books, I had a really good reading year as well. Uh, I hit a lot of sci-fi this year, and so that's my three year in that. My first title is The Martian by Andy Weir. Um, some sources say this is his first novel. Some say it's his third. I couldn't even tell going to the <laughs> author's website. So I'm going to call it a debut novel just, <laughs> just for, for fun. Uh, it was originally self-published and got enough notice on Amazon.com uh, sales that he got picked up by a traditional publisher. Uh, the Martian won the ALA Alex Award, which is an award for books with special appeal for young adults. Uh, but, it, you know, it could be shelved in the young adult section in your library. It could be in the adults. It's one of those uh, borderline choices. And this book is uh, being turned into a movie directed by Ridley Scott and starring Matt Damon, scheduled to release in November of 2015. Mm -hmm. So get the book read before you go see the movie. And uh, the book itself... Uh, NASA, and this happens in near future, so, you know, maybe in the next couple of years type of thing, but NASA has a manned expedition to Mars, and something goes wrong, and they have to evacuate. In all of the chaos, one of the crew gets left behind on the surface of Mars. Uh, now, main character Mark Watney has to try and survive on the planet without anyone else there and just with what was left behind. Uh, this book is a, a great balance of human drama and accurate science. So if you've got one of those hard sci-fi people, the science is on point. Um, it's great stuff. Uh, it makes it a, a compelling sci-fi read for people who don't read sci-fi because there's a lot of focus on the survival and the human drama as well. I think it's going to make a really good movie. I think it made a great book. Um, and, and I don't want to tell you any more about the plot because there are so many <laughs> Uh, successes and failures and it just keeps you going and, and it's it's fabulous so there's I, my I appreciate no spoilers because I'm reading it right now oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. yeah and I'm not a science science is not my forte but it's really easy to just skip those like kind of skim the hard side <laughs> yeah, because there's story. a lot of other human drama stuff yeah. with it so yeah. yes it's really interesting cool all right okay Okay. Yeah. Uh, this it. book should win the prize for the longest title last year. <laughs> yeah. Frozen in Time, an epic story of survival and a modern quest for lost heroes of World War II. Um, this, I like to read nonfiction uh, at least a few a year, and I love anything that's travel and adventure. So this one was right up my alley. Um, on November 5th, 1942, during World War II, and this is in Greenland, a U.S. cargo plane on a routine flight slammed into the Greenland ice cap. Four days later, they send a B-17 on a search and rescue mission. It becomes lost in a blinding storm and also crashes. Miraculously, all nine men that are on the B-17 survive. However, the plane is stuck on an ever-widening crevasse. 
and they are having to shelter under the wings of this plane in sub-zero weather. Um, so the U.S. military launches another rescue <laughs> operation, this time an amphibious plane sent to find the men on the B-17, and they are able to rescue one man, but on their way back to their ship, they fly into a storm and they crash. So this is the setting for this book. We now have three separate crashes that have happened. Um, and this is actually another one of those dual stories, almost like my first one, because the other half of this story, and I'll get back to the first part, is in present day Greenland. The author, Mitchell Zukoff, is with um, the U.S. Coast, members of the U.S. Coast Guard and a private company called North South Polar, who are attempting to um, find out what happened to the men on that third flight, because those were men of the Coast Guard. And the Coast Guard's motto is to never leave anyone behind. They have to find every person. They have never found the survivors. So we know those people right off were lost. But the question is, did any of these other people survive during this winter? And uh, this thing is so interesting. It turns out it's like the worst winter in Greenland ever. And these guys are trying to stay alive, and I will tell you, some of them survive, some of them don't. Uh, they are 148 days out there being lost in this brutal Arctic winter. And um, then they send some overland explorers, and so what happens eventually is that the B-17 group splits in two. So you've got now yet another group of people to follow. It sounds quite... Um, complex, but you just get so invested in the fate of these guys. I mean, this is from 50 or 60 years ago. You really care about these people. Did they live or did they die? Um, it's really a great adventure. Um, and I absolutely, anybody that likes war stories, anybody that um, likes, you know, true adventure and adversity kind of stories. This is really a great book for them. I not only read it, I also listened to the audio. Oh, yeah. It is so good. Um, I think uh, it's just kind of reminds us of what the military does for us. I mean, it's a poignant story about, you know, the risks that they take. The interesting thing is on that B-17 search and rescue mission, Five of those men were not scheduled to be on there. They volunteered to go help rescue those first ones. So they're absolutely willing to put their lives on the line to rescue other guys that we're working with. This book is a lot about character, but I was talking to Denise when we were traveling this week, and I said the biggest character in this book is Greenland, the mm -hmm. setting and the weather, because that was the key to everything that happened here was the awful, I, and I think the irony is, and Zukov points this out, is Greenland is called Greenland. <laughs> oh, I mean, it's not green at all. It's fair, oh. it's snow and crevasses, and it's a dangerous place to be. Mm -hmm. So um, if you've got people that like World War II and survival stories, this is absolutely my strongest recommendation for that. Great. And not Captain America. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. That's what the title, because I have, you know, I'm like minded. Um, the title oh. brought to me the first Some, Frozen yes. in Time, oh, Captain America. That's what happened to yeah. Me. yeah, well, um, you know, if you think about it, Frozen in Time, I mean, that's basically what these yes. men and their planes are. And I'm not yes. going to tell you what happened in um, the, the 2012 expedition. Mm. Um, you really need to, okay. to follow that expedition through this book. It's really good. Oh, sounds good. Okay, and Eric, you're um, up again. Actually, and before you start, okay. um, I looked up um, about Beryl Markham. That so yeah. there's another new book coming out, and oh. I so I found it. It's actually coming out in July, oh. called um, "Circling the Sun." Right. And it's That's written so by good. Paula McLean, who wrote *The Paris Wife*. Oh, about mm -hmm. Hemingway. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, it's interesting that it's a about the rivalry between Markham and Karen Blixen, who is the character that Meryl Streep played in yes. *Out of Africa*. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's what this yeah. new book is about that comes out in July. Yeah. *Circling the Sun*. Oh, so. thank you for that. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I want to switch gears here and go to an older book, Comedy, um, which I grew up reading, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, I don't want this to be confused with the last movie that was made about this, made by <laughs> um, Disney. I believe Disney made it, which was not that good and not really, to, to, you know, with the story. So I'm, I'm hoping maybe teenagers might pick this up again um, and rediscover it because uh, it was just something I read when I was younger. Um, it was originally... Um, written and performed on a British radio in 1978, and then it, it became a, um, uh, Ameri it came popular in America after it was released as a novel in, in 1979. Oh, Douglas Adams, of course, is the, um, is the author. Um, story goes as such. Okay. Uh, seconds before the Earth is, is uh, demolished to make room for a galactic freeway, Arthur Dent is plucked out off the planet by his friend, Ford Prefect, a researcher for the revised edition of the uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy from the planet Beetlejuice, who, for the last 15 years, has, has been posing as an out-of-work actor. So that's how it starts. <laughs> um, together, this dynamic uh, pair began a journey through, the, uh, um, through space, aided by quotes from the Hitchhiker's um, Guide. And one of the quotes is, a towel is about the most important, useful thing for an interstellar hi um, hitchhiker that it, they can have. <laughs> Uh, furthermore, the guide um, cover contains two big red letters of advice. Don't panic. <laughs> Our Arthur, okay, this Arthur and Ford meet up with fellow travelers. These, these interesting names. Zapod Beetlebrox, a two-headed, three-armed ex-hippie and totally out-to-lunch president of the galaxy. <laughs> Trillian, Zapod's girlfriend, formerly Trisha McMillan, who Arthur met at a cocktail party once, uh, once a time. Marvin, a paranoid, brilliant, but chronically depressed robot. <laughs> and Vet, a, a former graduate student who is obsessed with all the disappearance of all the ballpoint pens he bought over the years. <laughs> so that sets the tone for what kind of humor this is. Um, uh, you'll never read a funnier science fiction. I, I think it's, it's one of the finest ever. Um, Douglas Adams is a is masterfully uh, uh, intelligent satire, barbed wit, and um, comic dialogue. It is rich with comic detail and thought-provoking situations and stands up to multiple reads, and I should say multiple uh, years, too. It's, I think young people still like it. Um, it's required uh, reading, for I think, for science fiction fans. And the book series continues with the story with uh, the restaurant at the edge of the universe, life, the universe, and everything, and so long and thanks for all the fish. Which I think. <laughs> so if you're a big fan of the Monty Python era, I, as I was as a young person in British sitcoms, you would really, I think, really like this. It's an easy read, but it's it's just hilarious. So I wanted people to read. And if it's it. British, like, it'll have a whole different kind of humor. Yeah, oh, if it's British, if you like British humor, you'll, 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 you'll like this. It's just. But I never go anywhere without a towel. <laughs> I love that quote. That's yeah. There's so many good things. So I, I just really, I don't want to tell you how to end, but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, good. Okay, Denise. Well, this is a newer title that has gotten rave reviews, so I thought I'd listen to it. And I found out that author Paula Hawkins worked as a journalist in London for 15 years before writing her first thriller, this one, The Girl on the Train. In the beginning of this audiobook, the three narrators confused me. As I continued listening, I was able to differentiate between Rachel, Megan, and Anna the three characters that tell the story, but they all had English accents and all three presented the facts as they saw them. So it was in the very beginning of the audio, I think maybe reading it might have been a little simpler. But the story goes, the girl on the train is Rachel. She's grieving the loss of her marriage. She loses her job because of alcoholism, but hides this fact from her roommate by continuing to ride the train into London every day. Now this train stops near her ex-husband's home and Rachel fantasizes about the neighbors in her, in her old neighborhood. She gives them fake names and daydreams about their perfect marriages and lives. And then one day she sees the woman that she has, is just sure has the perfect life. This woman is kissing another man. And the day after that, the neighbor goes missing. The other two narrators are Rachel's ex-husband's new wife, Anna, and the neighbor woman that disappears, Megan, each have their own secrets, jealousies, and betrayals. 
Rachel actually inserts herself into the investigation about Megan's disappearance based on her observations from the train. She contacts Megan's husband, Scott, out of the blue. She doesn't know him. She just contacted him and said, hey, your wife must have been having an affair because I saw this from the train. And Hawkins, the author, shows how memory and imagination can get confused. Yeah. The twists and turns in the storyline kept me guessing. And each time I thought I knew who done it or actually what happened, because we don't, you don't know if Megan's, because she's still narrating, maybe she's still alive, or maybe somebody decided that was the end for her. But each time I thought I knew who done it or what had happened, the next narrator made me think it was someone else. This psychological thriller has been compared to a recent bestseller. Gone Girl fans will get in line for this recommendation. All right, so this is a book that um, I don't want to give too much away about right. it, but it was really fun to read. It was really fast paced. Um, so every day is the same for Melanie. The sound of the door leading down the corridor opening, footsteps approaching, the same people walking past her cell, her cheerful greetings um, unanswered, save for a nod or a terse smile. Soon she will be strapped to her wheelchair and taken to class with the other kids. The days when the beautiful and kind Miss Justino teaches lessons are the best. Melanie knows there's more to the world, but if she will ever be free to see it, no one will say. Um, so you may not be able to tell. This is a little bit of a spoiler, but you find out pretty early on. This is a zombie thriller. But oh it's not just your average kind of like mindless zombie horde eating people kind of thing. <laughs> um, it, has, it has twists on that whole kind of story that we're used to. Um, the characters are all really dynamic. The main character is a 10-year-old zombie. That's a tiny spoiler you find out right away in the beginning. So um, written from that perspective, I mean, it's, that in itself is kind of intriguing of like, how, how do you write a story from that perspective? Um, it isn't really a story for people who like nice, tidy endings. I'll just say that. Um, and there's a few reasons that you'd want to pay attention to this book. Um, well, three if you count that it's zombies and a full <laughs> of zombies. So, <laughs> But um, M.R. Carey, Mike Carey, is um, a fairly recognizable comic book writer. He wrote for Marvel and DC. So that name alone will pull people in. Um, and then they've also started filming the movie this month. Mm -hmm. um, so there's no expected release date, but uh, it is definitely set for the big screen. So it's something to keep your eye on. And it's just, it's so good. Like it's <laughs> one of my favorites this year so far. Is it contemporary? Yes. Well, or no. Futuristic. It's futuristic. Okay. <laughs> it's actually 20 years after the initial infection okay. sets in. So it's way in the future, contemporary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, maybe we're already infected and we don't know it. Yeah. It's possible, know. considering the storyline and how... <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> okay. You're going to get us all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Scott? All righty. Leviathan Wakes by James S.A. Corey. Um, I have no zombie follow-up for this, but, <laughs> but let me tell this this sci-fi book was actually put on my reading list because of a noir mystery reading club because there's uh, things of, of noir mystery, some traditional elements of that, plus horror elements. So you've got sci-fi, noir mystery, and horror all put in, and it's all masterfully crafted. It, it, you don't feel like, oh, we're in the horror section now. It, it just There's builds, and, and things just integrate really well. Um, this book is the debut novel of James S.A. Corey, I say debut in air quotes, if you didn't see me in the little window there, <laughs> because it's actually a collaboration between authors Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank. Um, this is the first of the Expanse series. So yes, it's a, it's a, it's a series in sci-fi. It was nominated for the Locus and Hugo Awards, did not win those, but um, there's tough competition. And it is being adapted for television. The series will be called Expanse. It'll be on sci-fi. It should begin 
later this year. The trailer is already out on YouTube. Um, I, I will not comment on, on how closely the trailer matches this 400-page book. <laughs> uh, you know, yeah. but, uh, but anyway, for the actual story, uh, like I said, this book combines sci-fi, more mystery and horror. Humanity has colonized Mars, various moons, and the asteroid belts. This is far future. Um, society has evolved very differently. Uh, all these colonies have different roles. They depend on each other for different things. Water is hauled by spaceship. It's like they latch onto a big clump of ice in space and haul it to an asteroid. The asteroids, uh, they mine those for minerals, and they all depend on each other. However, a big explosion, I won't tell you how or why that happens, um, sparks tensions and threatens war across the solar system. Um, you trade chapters between the two point of view characters. Detective Miller, who's a detective on an asteroid, and then Captain Holden, who is the captain of one of those ice freighters. Um, this book is a real page turner, which is good because it is a long book. Um, and like I said, it's first in the series, but this is a standalone story. So you can read this and feel satisfied at the ending that there is some closure to part of it. The, the next series does not automatically pick, off, pick up from this. There's some gaps. So um, really, I, I just finished this one a couple months ago, and I'm still going through the story in my head. It, it, it lasts with you a little bit. So... Cool. Okay. Okay, we're going to start our last round here. Um, we're back to Sharon. Take it away. Okay, well, anybody that knows me well, or even not so well, knows that I love Ireland. So it's probably not a big surprise <laughs> that I'm reading the Irish Country Doctor series. And this is the newest title, An Irish Country Doctor in Peace and at War. Um, a little bit about the series, if you're not familiar with it. Um, it's set in Valley Buckle Bow, very Irish name there, in uh, Northern Ireland, and it's set in the 1960s. So think about the political context of the 1960s, because we still have a very divided Ireland there. And this is Northern Ireland, so of course that's the British part of it. Um, and there are many people up there that don't want to be in the British part of it. They want to be uh, in the Irish Republic. So um, in the first book, we have we meet newly qualified uh, Dr. Barry Laverty, and he comes to work for Fingal Flaherty O'Reilly. Now, there's a really good Irish name for you, too. Um, Valley Bucklebo is a really tiny, tiny town, and Fingal is the heart and soul of the town, and everybody looks to him for answers not only on their medical questions, but all of their life decision questions. So that's kind of a setup for this whole series. Um, and each of the books has followed different characters or different periods in, um, in Fingal's life. Um, this particular book, as you can tell from the title, uh, it's a flip back between his uh, war years. He was um, in World War II. He served as a medical officer on uh, a ship. He was in the Merchant Navy. So he was uh, re-upped during World War II to serve there. And I'll tell you, a big piece of this is pretty harrowing uh, description of what the battle, what it was like as a medical doctor during a battle, uh, uh, you know, where they're being heavily attacked. And, you know, how do you deal with all of those injuries afterwards? Um, and then um, at that point in the story, too, something we've, as readers have been waiting for, we have known since book one that he had um, he had been married to a gal named Deirdre, and we've known nothing about her until now. This is like book seven. Mm -hmm. So finally, the author, Patrick Taylor, is going to give us a little bit of information on her and what she was like. Um, so we get a little bit of the final story. Uh, and this one really, it alternates between the 1940s and the 60s, and, but it's not hard to, I mean, it's pretty easy to tell this is a war chapter versus this is modern day Valley Buckle Bow. This is one of those towns, it's got quirky characters, you get to know them, you get to love them, you get to hate some of them. Um, and, you know, it falls in the gentle read genre. So if you've got people who read James, still read James Harry, I don't know if anybody does, but or have liked Jan Karen's um, Father Tim novels, this is a really good series for them to read. Um, the good news is Patrick Taylor was 
a doctor. He is retired now, and he was a doctor in a small town in Ireland. So I think an awful lot of this is probably based upon his memories mm -hmm. of those years. Um, so it, it really rings true for me as a reader. So if you like Ireland, if you like fun kind of stories like with good characters, this is a good one. Great. Eric? Okay. Uh, I just realized I do have a theme with my three books. Um, they're all British authors, so <laughs> I just realized that now. Uh, so I guess I have a bias. Eric. I won't do it. I won't use the British accent. But um, <laughs> my last one, uh, Brand Design. Maybe most people know Stephen Hawking. This was written in 2010, so it's more, it's more, you know, fairly uh, more recent. <laughs> I usually read a lot of stuff. I read a lot of science, so um, but I think this is also accessible to all non-scientists. Um, but I will talk more about it. Um, um, how can we understand the world in which uh, we find ourselves? Over 20 years ago, Hawking wrote uh, A Brief History in Time and tried to explain where the universe came from and where it's going. Uh, this book um, left some important questions unanswered. Why is, why is there a universe? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why do we exist? Uh, um, why are there laws of nature and uh, where are we? Did the universe need a designer or creator? Um, Hawking, a renowned uh, Cambridge mathematician, along with another person whose name I can't pronounce. I don't know how to pronounce his last, his uh, Leonard, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. <laughs> uh, he co-wrote it. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see, where was I here? Um, you know, presents a, br a brief uh, introduction to the grand design of the universe. It seems like an ambitious, uh, ambitious uh, endeavor, but general readers are able to follow along with, with the author when he goes through M theories, quantum mechanics, general and special relativity, and other mind-blowing cosmological discoveries of the last century. <clears throat> the goal of these journeys um, through the history of science is to answer some basic questions. Why is our universe in the first place? Um, and other, um, other, and may other universes exist possibly in the theory of multiverse or multi-universes, which is the latest thing in, in, in the sciences. Uh, along with the spirit of the of the popular TV um, series Cosmos in 1980 by Carl Sagan, which I think they remade recently, which has just come out, uh, Hawking's not only explains the early uh, history of science well, but also the latest discoveries uh, and makes it accessible to non-scientists again uh, with lots of wit and humor. In fact, he, he quotes uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy several times. <laughs> um, it gives modern science a wonder, the wonderful and imagine, imagination that would interest many, especially I think young adults who are entering or in college who are wishing to have a career in science. I think it, it's written about that level and I think they would really, uh, really enjoy it. Um, not only is it fascinating debate between science and religious issues, it's a debate between different aspects of theoretical sciences, especially with the controversial concept of M theory or better known as string theory or super string, which sounds like a superhero type thing issues. <laughs> um, uh, finally, unlike the, the answers of the ultimate question of life, universe, and everything uh, given at the Hitchhiker's, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the answers they provide in the grand design are not simply 42. Of course, if you read this, you understand the joke. Or that means. <laughs> yeah. So uh, there's no real answers. It's more of a um, just getting a good debate going, and it's just fascinating. I, I, I read that for fun. So, yeah, I do read that stuff for fun. Um, <laughs> but it, it's something I think a lot of people would enjoy. Um, and of course, they recently made a movie about his life. I forgot yeah. the name of it. Yeah. And that one, mm, I think, the Best theory, Picture, or what's yeah. it called? The, the Theory of Everything. everything. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, and I haven't seen it yet, but I'd like to see that. But yeah, he's a fascinating person. So. Mm -hmm. That's my last one. Okay, great. Okay, <clears throat> Denise. Right, now, the other two audiobooks I listened to were debut novels. This is not a debut novel. Kristen Hanna is a New York Times bestselling author of 22 books. However, the Nightingale is completely different than any of her titles that I've read or listened to. The book tells the story of two French sisters, Vienne and Isabel, during World War II. Their mother died and their father abandoned them. Vienne was old enough to get married and have a family, while Isabel was shuffled from boarding school to convent, getting kicked out of each and every one. By the time Isabel was 18, Germany had invaded France. Being young and rebellious, Isabel joined the French resistance. Vienne's husband was called to fight at the front, and she was consumed with protecting her daughter during the unimaginable hardships the French were subjected to during the German occupation. There came a point where Vienne concluded that she needed to resist the Germans 
or know that she was becoming just like them. And this is when her life changes and it becomes even more difficult. You just start out at unimaginable and go from there. It gets even worse. This story is narrated by one of the sisters in the present time. Although you don't really know until the very end which sister it is. So you're not sure how, how they both came out of the war. This is another audiobook that I really hated to turn off when I got where I was going. It really made the miles fly by but I had to be careful because there were times I was crying through the book <laughs> and I didn't really want to stop in for a visit with a librarian with puffy red eyes and a drippy nose. <laughs> so narrator Polly Stone transported me to 1930s France with her accent and excellent performance. The Nightingale will be popular with book clubs that generally select historical fiction and Amazon offers an inexpensive Kindle book with summary and analysis. This companion to the title provides details of characters and key character analyses and discussions of themes and symbols. I enjoyed The Nightingale and will recommend it to friends and family members that have an interest in World War II. I believe I would have finished the story much more quickly, even though it's a huge book. There's 14 discs. Um, I think I would have finished it quick, more quickly if I had actually read it. The frustrating thing about listening to audiobooks is that I must wait until I can get in the car for a drive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Denise, I think you've made a really good point with the audios about the emotional effect that they have on you. I mean, I've done the same thing where, you know, you, you stop the car and you got to finish listening to a chapter, whether I actually missed a turn off on the interstate one time. <laughs> and in Nebraska, that can mean another yes, 10 or 15 miles. Um, and I, I even remember the book. It was On the Beach by Neville Shute. And oh, well, I made a yeah. really horrifying realization about what was really going on in that book. And it, you know, it kind of devastates you sometimes. And you're right, there's such an emotional impact sometimes from listening that you may not get from the book, mm -hmm. reading it. Yeah, I agree. Okay, um, Anika? All right, so this next book, um, Nothing Daunted, The Unexpected Education of Two Society Girls in the West. Um, this was in 1918, I believe, was the year that they spent out um, in the West. So Dorothy Woodruff and Rosamond Underwood wanted to experience more in life than simply attending parties, eating fancy dishes, and marrying the first eligible bachelor that proposed. Uh, they wanted adventure and a chance to make things better for people in the world. Um, against all conventions, the two women set off for Elkhead, Colorado, a widespread homesteading community, um, to be school teachers in the newly built schoolhouse. Um, in all conditions, the two friends made the ride on horseback to and from school. Um, they lived with a family out in Elkhead. Um, they tirelessly cared for their students and community. They were in charge of organizing um, dances and all sorts of community events at the school as well because it was really one of the only central structures. I mean, it was this, like, for the time, it was this gorgeously built school. It was stone and it had windows and it had, you know, heating <laughs> and all those kinds of things. Um, hey, those are still being used in Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so they really tested their mettle along the way. When they first moved out there, they had never cooked for themselves. And um, they maybe still didn't really learn how to cook for themselves too well because the, the woman that the mother that they lived with um, loved taking care of them, loved helping them. And But they did get trapped out at the house one time in the winter because they were riding and sometimes the, the snow was way up to their, like, well, on horseback, I guess it was up to the horse's belly sometimes. And the kids themselves, the students, would walk in all conditions. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think maybe one day they missed mm -hmm. all year. Um, so Dorothy Wickeden um, is uh, the author is actually Dorothy Woodruff's granddaughter. Um, and so she pulled together their story um, through personal correspondence, uh, recorded oral histories from folks that were still alive, diary entries, interviews, um, and newspaper articles. And it's not just a story of the, uh, these two women's experience, but it's also um, a really intriguing look at the complex histories of railroad expansion, workers' rights, women's rights, progressive education, homesteading, and socioeconomic status in the early 20th century. Because these girls are really involved in all 
their community out in New York, in Auburn, New York, um, was really more of the progressive kind of circle out in that way. So she ties in all of those different th historical aspects. Um, it reads like a novel for the most part. There's a few storylines um, between the women's stories and the historical uh, facts that are a little choppy, but really it's, it flows really nice. And um, it's really interesting, it mentions Nebraska. So anybody that's interested in that type in that uh -huh. time period and homesteading, all the yeah. things, mm -hmm. would love it. Sounds neat. Yeah. Okay. And? Okay. <laughs> uh, my last title, it, it, if you chose one of my titles to read, this would be my strongest recommendation, Ancillary Justice uh, by Anne Lecky. Unlike my others, this one is a debut novel. No asterisks, <laughs> no air quotes. <laughs> Guaranteed first novel. Uh, the author started writing this when she was a stay-at-home mom and got bored and, and worked her way up and got it attended the Clarion Workshop and studied oh. under uh, sci-fi legend Octavia Butler. So that's starting with, you know, I'm bored, I'm all right, a book. Oh, I'm studying under Octavia <laughs> Butler. And this is her debut novel, and it won the Hugo, the Nebula, the Arthur C. Clarke, the Locust, the BFSA, and a ton of other local smaller ones. This is a great book, period. It is the first of the Imperial Rotch, I can't, I hope I pronounced that right, uh, series. Um, and it's been optioned for television, but nothing has been done since because I don't know how you would do this for television. It's too grand. Uh, the alien species are too alien. It'd be a lot of CGI or prosthetics, but someone thinks they, they could do it, so more power to them. <laughs> Um, man, where do I start with this book? This is a mind-blowing type of book. Um, the concepts behind it are just, wow. Um, I'll, I'll start with a story. Uh, the, a lone soldier named Breck, who had previously been part of a hive mind with a sentient spaceship, okay, did I lose anyone yet? <laughs> is now cut off from that collective. So before had the entire resources of a spaceship and the computer banks, be able to see anywhere on the spaceship, hear anything, and now you're a solo person with just your own senses, and you don't even have a memory bank. Yeah. You know, you just ha have your own little experiences. So there's that feeling of being part of something huge and now pff, cut down. Um, and Breck has to figure out what happened. How did Breck get cut off from everything else. You notice I did not use pronouns because this book, it, the characters are highly androgynous, not just in mm -hmm. appearance, but in presentation. Mm -hmm. There's very few he, Personal she. Personal pronouns. Right, yeah. and, and one of the things is, if you're a spaceship, gender means nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one of the races yeah. is, is very androgynous. You don't know until they actually come up and tell you if they do that at all. So they're, they're the story is great, and then some of the concepts behind it add just this extra punch to it. Um, there's lots of interesting mind games dealing with the one race conquering another. This is a conquering race. These are soldiers. What happens when they do take over a planet? What happens after that? Um, some internal civil war type of things. What does it mean to be human? You're dealing with Breck, who's now cut off and now has to become human. Uh, redemption, revenge, I talked about the gender identity. Um, it's all, you know, I could go with just the story, but it would lose half of the impact of this book if I tried to, you know, make it, you know, cut out all that extra stuff. Um, it's one of those books that I think you need to experience as a whole, as opposed to someone chopping it up and doing a book talk. So if that doesn't sell it to you, I <laughs> I don't know. It, it is hard, you know, a lot of sci-fi, uh, but I think it's real, even in non-sci-fi, you may want to give it a shot because of all those other concepts behind it. The culture, the mm -hmm. gender exploration, fascinating stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other people agree because all of those awards. <laughs> um, yeah. The sequel has been published this year, and I think the third one is scheduled for another two years, I think. Um, and I really did get the I did get the feeling of wanting to know more about this world. It's an amazing world building uh, at the end. Yeah. So uh, if you want to wait for the whole series to to be finished, 
you might have to wait a while. Mm -hmm. I would recommend not waiting. Get this one in. Um, hopefully, I can get the second one started here pretty soon. There's another one that doesn't leave you hanging, too. So once it's over, it's okay. The, yeah, the there's, there, there's a good. It's okay. This small part of the story has finished, but mm -hmm. there's this bigger world, this bigger universe out there for, for you to explore in the next one. So, but yeah, there, there is some closure to the main storyline uh, that you'll see there. Just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, Scott, tell us if you liked it. <laughs> you know, uh, it, 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 it was no, uh, you know, War and Peace, but yeah. no, no I, it, this is probably one of the best books I had read in the past few years. Oh, um, and I, I, I said earlier, I had a great yeah. reading year. Uh -huh. yeah. This would probably be the, the highlight of it. Um, just because of all of the different things it was able to meld in. Into oh, one we're non-science fiction fans. Enjoy you it. You know, non-science fiction fans may want to give it a shot, but don't be surprised if they put it down. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then there's also some science fiction fans that would not like this because right. of it's not traditional sci-fi. Right. There's all those elements, space battles, laser guns, etc. But there's so much more, and some people yeah. may get turned off of that. Um, but I would suggest give it a try. If it's not for you, okay. Well, I think that's. Oh gosh, our timing was so <laughs> good. Yeah, guys. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, from all of you. Um, I had a really good time here today. I hope you guys did. Um, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, and, final um, sliders is the last one. Hmm? Anything else? Nope. That's oh, it. Fade to black. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really enjoyed this. I hope that our listeners did. I hope they got some great reading suggestions. And um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, I unfortunately or fortunately, depending on your point of view, now have a bunch of other things I need to read. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or ideas for books. And, uh, oh, well. It's okay. I got a gift card to Barnes & Noble for my birthday, so I Good deal. <laughs> I'm set. So thank you, everyone, for being here. That was great. Thank, thank you, everyone, you. for attending. Um, there weren't any questions or comments throughout. Um, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> um, as we said, there is a biography. We did, um, Laura put together a list of the books that are on yes, this page yeah. for um, this episode. It'll be included afterwards as well. Um, that has all the titles there and the links to them in the world cat. So um, if you want to find them all in your library, that's where you can find it. But at least also, if you just want to buy or something, like I did mention Barnes and Noble, um, <laughs> you've got all the info here for that. Um, the slides will also be included on this page when we get the recording up as well. So you have all those as, as well if you want all those um, uh, book covers. So that will wrap it up for today's Encompass Live. Um, as I said, it's been recorded. It'll be available maybe later today when we get it all processed. Um, um, so that wraps up for this morning. Um, I hope you join us next week on our topic is IT security for libraries. Mm -hmm. Important topic, yeah. yes. Uh, Blake Carver, who runs LIS Host, great web uh, uh, hosting for library type peoples, uh, will be with us. He was here a few years ago, I think it was 2012, doing a similar, the same thing, mm -hmm. and very popular, but you know, things change over time. Yeah, so he's do. coming back to update us on how to keep your what else you need to do to keep your library safe as far as IT and security. So definitely sign up for that and any of our other shows we have coming up in the next month. They're all listed there on the Encompass Live website. Our recordings go over here. Underneath here says Archived Encompass Live Sessions. So our um, we will have, um, as we have here from last week, the recording and the presentation and the bibliography will be all linked there for you. Um, other than that, if you are a big Facebook user, Encompass Live is on Facebook. We have a Facebook page. If you go ahead and like us over there, you'll get announcements and recordings are available. Reminders, as I did here this morning, of when it's time to log in for today's show. So if you are big on Facebook, give us a like over there um, to keep an eye on what we're doing here. Other than that, that will wrap it up for this morning. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Bye-bye.